Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph de Lobenfels. My lecture today is going to address the sort of math that's needed for a statistics graduate program. In particular, a PhD program. Prerequisites needed calculus, a little stat, a little statistics would be helpful but not necessary. Best reference I can think of for very thorough coverage of this subject is the book by Walter Rudin. R-U-D-I-N. It's titled Principles of Mathematical Analysis. One piece of terminology, absolutely essential. You've seen an equal sign, extra line. That's shorthand for definition coming. The unifying theme for this kind of math is the notion of limit of a sequence. Here's the terminology for it. I'm going to tell you a couple of shorthands here. Here's a particularly symbolic terminology. Uh, more in words, x sub n converges to l. These are all, each one of these is shorthand for the following statement. Limit as n goes to infinity. x sub n equals L. After you write this a few times, then you appreciate shorthands. I'll draw a picture of it. Let's count on the x-axis, one, two, three, etc. On the y-axis, I'll put the corresponding values of the sequence. Maybe it starts here, jumps down here, bounces up back here. Could be negative. 
Crazy things can happen at first. Random variations. What a limit is talking about is the behavior at infinity, meaning n gets really large. Imagine a horizontal dotted line. Eventually, these dots are supposed to settle down, get close to that line. What we're talking about here is approximation. What that limit means, arbitrarily good approximations. These will be guaranteed. Approximations of L by Xn. As N goes to infinity, as N gets large. You don't know how much accuracy you want. Laser retinal surgery, maybe two decimal points, isn't enough. So arbitrarily good approximations. Anything you ask for, you can get eventually. So all I want to do for the rest of this lecture is examples. Mostly informal, I want to give some idea of the scope of this idea of a limit of a sequence. Let's start with a popular number, pi. Somewhere early in arithmetic, we get the idea of a decimal approximation. You don't want to stop here. That's not pi yet. So we're talking here about what's called a decimal expansion. Please be very nervous whenever you see three dots. Someone is hiding something there. What does that mean, that decimal expansion? You can form a sequence out of these numbers. Start with three. There's a lousy approximation of pi. Add on the point one. That's a better approximation. Add on the next digit, 3.14. But please don't stop there. Nasty habit. Uh, the next digit, 3.141. Keep doing that. Keep adding on more digits of the decimal expansion. That will converge to the number pi. So decimal expansion means that particular sequence converging to whatever you're trying to get, whatever you've written a decimal expansion down for. You can also get the number pi as an infinite sum. 
I'll do it for pi over 4. I'm going to use, this is called summation terminology. Going from k equals 0 to infinity. What this means, definition coming, what this means is you start with k equals 0 and keep plugging in larger and larger integers k. k equals 0 gives you the number 1. k equals 1 gives you a negative one third, and so on. Looks like a pattern of alternating pluses or minuses, unit fractions, odd denominator. What that infinite sum means, form a sequence by just taking a few of those numbers. Start out with the one. I'm going to form a sequence now. Number one, that's the first member of the sequence. Throw on the minus one third. So now we're getting the number two thirds. One more term. Throw on the plus one fifth. After some rapid calculation, that turns out to be 13 over 15. That sequence is guaranteed to converge to pi over 4. Infinite sum. That's another example of a sequence. You just add on more and more terms to form a convergent sequence. Here's another popular sequence. That's in parentheses, 1 plus 1 over n raised to the nth power. Let's write down a few of those terms. Plug in n equals 1 first. That just looks like 2. That's the first member of that sequence. Then plug in n equals 2. That comes out to 9 over 4. Then plug in n equals 3. That comes out to 64 over 27. That sequence converges to another very popular irrational number, lowercase e, stands for exponential. That's only one of many ways to define this number. Uh, this sequence actually turns up with uh, compound interest. The n corresponds to the number of times you compound every year.
here's a different style for producing a sequence. Give yourself a starting point, x sub 0. I'll define it to be 2. And the definition now, you look at the n plus first term, it's going to be defined in terms of the previous term, x sub n. I'm going to do an average of x sub n and 3 divided by x sub n. This relation we're constructing starting with n equals 0. Let's write down the first few terms to get some idea what's happening here. If I wanted to get to x sub 1, for example, just like n equals 0, looks like we're averaging x sub 0 and 3 divided by x sub 0. We do at least know what x sub 0 is. That simplifies to 7 over 4, or 1.75. After that, we could get x sub 2. According to the same rule, x sub 2 is an average of the previous term, the x sub 1, and 3 over x sub 1. Getting a little messy already. We have to plug in what we got for x sub 1. That'll be some kind of fraction. I'll just tell you the decimal approximation. That's how you generate the sequence, one step at a time. Every time you take a step, you refer back to the step you just took. It's called a recursive definition. Recursion referring to this repetitive nature. You keep plugging into this formula, this machine, to generate more terms. This sequence converges, turns out to converge to the square root of 3. It's a method for getting rational approximations of the square root of 3. Since we're aiming at statistics graduate students, I'd like to mention some topics from statistics. What's called the law of large numbers. I'll put down the symbols first, then I'll tell you what they mean. Here's a capital X sub N, horizontal line over it. That's converging to, that's a Greek letter mu. The X sub N stands for sample mean. The end refers to the sample size.
high-end things that you're measuring, calculating, making fill out a questionnaire. Greek letters traditionally mean population. Mu stands for population mean. Something you definitely like to happen. When you take averages over larger and larger samples, you'd like to believe that that converges to the population mean. And keep in mind that populations in general are infinite. If you're talking about people, say, you don't just mean the people sitting around right now. It's people, past, present, future. Anyone who might be born sometime, past, present, or future. Let's make a much more general statement. Arguably the definition of statistical inference. What a statistician does is use samples to make statements about populations. That's your sequence. Samples of size n, n getting larger and larger. You keep grabbing more people, more things to measure. As the sample size goes to infinity, that's supposed to converge to the population. Something you need to worry about, something any statistician needs to worry about, the nature of the convergence can be very mysterious. I'm going to write down some big name results. You may or may not have heard of them. The exact statement is not important. All I want to indicate in these examples is that the nature of the convergence keeps changing. Different results have a different notion of convergence. We mentioned the law of large numbers. There are two versions, weak and strong. And possibly the most famous result of all, certainly the least believable, is the central limit theorem. That's the one that says, with lots of data, everything starts to look like a bell curve. When you look at the average of the data, the distribution starts changing into a bell curve. Each one of these has a different definition of convergence. That weak law of the convergence is called improbability. The strong law, the convergence is called almost surely. And the central limit theorem has the weakest notion of all. The convergence is called in distribution. Let's get back to numbers. I want to come back to this notion of different types of convergence. 
So I'd rather do that with numbers. What's called a geometric series. That's a particular infinite sum. I'll use the summation terminology first. You got a fixed number r and you're raising it to higher and higher powers. So this will mean 1 plus r plus r squared infinitely many terms arbitrarily high powers of r. For example, take r to be one half, now we're talking about one half to the k, that'll look like one plus a half plus a quarter, That's one of Zeno's paradoxes. Adding up powers of one half. To get from here to the chalkboard, that chalkboard, first I go half the distance, then I go half the remaining distance. That's infinitely many steps, infinitely many halves. It sounds impossible. That was the paradox. When you think of it that way, it appears to be impossible for me to reach the chalkboard. There turns out to be a very nice formula for adding these things up, even though it's infinitely many numbers. Very general formula. Turns out to add up to 1 over 1 minus r. But I have to throw on a qualification here. Let's try that out with Zeno's paradox. Let's see if it really is a paradox. I'm plugging in r equals one half. I'll leave it to you to simplify that. It comes out to two. Makes sense from Zeno's point of view if you think of it. Take away this initial step one, just deal with the halves. You're trying to make the entirety, the whole of that distance, be covered. That's the extra one that you get from all the halves. Let's try a different value of r. Negative 1. I'll plug r equals negative 1 into this nice looking formula. That means that when you look at that infinite sum, minus 1 to the k, plug in k equals 0, anything to the 0 is 1. Jump up to k equals 1. That'll just be a minus one. K equals two. The squaring turns it positive. All we're doing is alternating between 
plus or minus one. Hard to tell what it's doing exactly. We might as well plug into this formula, but I feel nervous about it, so I'm going to put up question marks. There's the number r, 1 over 1 minus r. That simplifies to 1 half, question mark, question mark. Remember that infinite sum means you look at sequence of partial sums. You change the infinite sum into a sequence. Start with the first term. Then add on the second term. Then add up the first three terms. I see a pattern. The sequences are jumping back and forth between 1 and 0. 0, 1, 0, 1. Let's make a sketch of that. The same sketch I made of the picture of a sequence in general. Let's see, we're starting out at positive 1, jump down to 0, back up to positive 1, This isn't really the picture of convergence. Remember, the picture is horizontal line that things get squashed towards. There's kind of a dampening going, that going on. These guys just stay the same distance apart. So you might believe that that doesn't converge. in the usual sense. There isn't time to write down the definition of the usual sense. We could call it the uh, dampened oscillation sense. And yet, when you look at this number one-half, there's a plausibility to it. All you're getting are zeros and ones. The one half is splitting the difference. It's the spirit of compromise, equally far away from the positive terms and the zero terms. That one half is definitely trying to appease both extremes. So it is a plausible number even for this goofy sequence we're getting. Let me write it down again. There is a sense in which these numbers converge. When you look at the averages, the averages of the terms of the sequence, those actually will converge. Let's put them over here. First the number 1. No averaging to do there. Next term you average the first two terms 1 and 0. First two terms of this sequence here. That looks like 1 half. Then we average the first three terms, 
That comes out to two thirds. Then the first four terms. That comes out to a half again. Um, this sequence does converge to one half in the usual sense. As n goes to infinity, you actually do get convergence. So the point I'm making here is you've got a sequence that doesn't converge in one sense, but in another sense, in what turns out to be a weaker notion of convergence, you are guaranteed convergence. Apparently, we have to be careful. We have to specify what we mean by convergence. I'd like to do some things more geometric now. Take a disk of radius 1, just the right half. You can get that as the graph of x squared plus y squared equals 1. But I'm just going to look at positive x. What I want to do is approximate that disk with rectangles. Slightly bigger, slightly outside the disk, covering the disk when you put all those rectangles together. I want to make these rectangles skinnier and skinnier. Let's have this rectangle go from k over n to k plus 1 over n. This skinny thing here. So k here is going from 0 to n minus 1. When you put all those rectangles together, let's make a, at least a rough drawing of that. You'll have a rectangle here, then a rectangle there. Eventually you get down to pretty small rectangles like so. So imagine putting together all these shaded rectangles. I'll call that capital P sub N, the union of all those rectangles like I shaded, K going from 0 to N minus 1. What I'm hoping this reminds you of is a Riemann sum from calculus. These are the things that you use to approximate the integral. So I'm going to leave calculations to you. When you look at the area of P sub n, And let n go to infinity. Here's an explicit expression for p sub n. You're adding up areas of rectangles. Here's the exact expression 
for a fixed n. It's a Riemann sum applied to this function here. As n goes to infinity, this converges to pi over 2. And that's the area of the half disk that we appear to be approximating. So there's a successful approximation scheme. Rectangles we understand, so we use them to make approximations. Our limit statement is saying that these approximations work. You can force them to be arbitrarily close to the area that you care about, the area of that half disk. So that's good news. When you look at the perimeter, something entirely different is going to happen. The perimeter of P sub n, I claim that doesn't actually change. I claim that it's always 6. Remember, the PN is the union of all those rectangles. Perimeter here means <clears throat> go sideways, then go down, sideways again, then go down. Eventually, you've got a horizontal displacement of one from there to there. Vertical displacement of two. When you add those all up, it comes out to six. Doesn't matter what n is. Doesn't matter how carefully you slip in those skinny rectangles. I certainly understand convergence here. 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, et cetera, et cetera. That's just going to converge to 6. That's the easiest kind of convergence. But the bad news here is that we're not getting the perimeter of the half disk. The perimeter of the half disk is 2 plus pi. So as an approximation scheme goes, it fails miserably. So my point here is that when you say these rectangles converge to the half disk, you must make it clear what you mean. The areas converge, yes. The perimeters do not converge. Definitely some delicacy here. It looked like a perfectly plausible approximation scheme, but you have to be careful when you talk about convergence. Let me end on a more positive note. A similar sort of uh, geometry scheme that will converge both for the area and for the perimeter. We are up to example 9. Capital Q sub n here. This will be a regular n-gon. That means n sides, each side equal always inscribed in the unit disk. For example, n equals 3, that would be a triangle, equilateral triangle. 
n equals 4, that would be a square inscribed in the unit disk again. We'll probably regret this, but let's try n equals 5, a regular pentagon inside the unit disk, something like that. Classical Greeks used these polygons to approximate pi, since pi is the area of the unit disk. Actually, when they wanted to do an actual proof of the area, they not only put polygons on the inside, they put them on the outside. We can make a more explicit statement than the classical Greeks. Uh, both the area and the perimeters turn out to involve trig functions, sine and cosine. When you look at the area of Q sub n, That's got both a sine and a cosine in it. And this turns out to converge as n goes to infinity to pi. That's the area of the unit disk. So that's good. That's a good result. When you look at the perimeter, get a slightly simpler expression. That turns out to converge to 2 pi. which you might recognize as the perimeter of the circle. Circumference is more traditional word. So that time the convergence worked for both the area and the perimeter. You never know in general. It's something that you should worry about at all times. Okay, I'll stop the lecture there.